what I'd like to do is, is talk about the origin of this diagram, because I've, I've looked at it for a number of years. If you look on Wikipedia and you look up the commons, this is what you're going to find. And uh, it's a bit disturbing because there's a history behind this diagram. And this is a neoliberal attempt to sell the commons to you in a particular package. And this is a very interesting diagram because it uh, was developed as a result of the public choice school of James Buchanan. James Buchanan is an economist who's had a, a career promoting uh, libertarianism. <coughs> And this particular diagram was a result of James Buchanan's interpretations of Paul Samuelson's work. Now, I know that's going over some of your heads, but Paul Samuelson was a kind of uh, proponent of Keynesianism. So after World War II, it suddenly dawned on some economists that they begin to talk about not only private goods, but let's call these other things public goods. And it hadn't really been in the vernacular until around the time of uh, post-war period. So then public goods and private goods became a kind of, oh yeah, we get it, okay, and it, it fit in with Keynesianism because of the, the idea that uh, the stimulus, stimulus of the economy was, uh, was actually a public good, and oh, by the way, the state provides security and other kinds of public goods, so, so now we've got this binary system. James Buchanan came along and said, let's change it, let's broaden the scope, but we don't want anything like this because it would look like a Hegelian model. It would look like a dialectic, and God forbid we want anything that smacks of Marxism and a, and a proposiveness or teleology. Let's, let's create it like this. So they completed this with the club goods, which is a, a really an adjunct to, to, uh, to private goods and also public goods. But they created a, a brand new thing so they could keep us in the box, literally. <laughs> so, okay, that's, that's the point I want to make. So, <laughs> so, I, you know, this is a, a completely arbitrary diagram. However, it does speak to a kind of proposiveness that perhaps it's, it's um, good to address, which is that are we really talking about the commons as this whole thing or just as the subcategory? And for right now, it's certainly the subcategory, but, but even that is a kind of, if you look at this as a, a Freudian model even, like this is the conscious and this is the unconscious. <laughs> Seriously. And that's how North South started. The idea of the global North and the global South being uh, people in the global South had um, a kind of the unconscious contents that they were bringing to the, to the uh, rich, uh, overdeveloped consciousness of the, of the North. And that's why the model really took hold, because it expressed something in the global psyche that, that made sense. If we look at the, this is that kind of model, no wonder this, this has been repressed, because we don't, because it's, it's rather un, unarticulated. And it hasn't brought its contents to the surface, where we are much more conscious of this dialectic we hear all the time between the private sector and the public sector. And that seems to capture the headlines, and that's the debate. And as I mentioned the other day, to the, to the extent of repressing all the, uh, the knowledge about the commons and the fact that we take the people and their resources completely for granted. So in that sense, then, what, what are we really talking about here? And that gets to the essence of the presentation that I wanted to make, which is about interest rates. And you know, there are many different leverage points that are really important to get into. So, national sovereignty. That's a tremendous leverage point because that, that leads to certain elements of discussion. Private property, obviously a, a very important discussion. But interest rates are really very interesting. And um, you know, Jesus and Muhammad talked about anti-usury kinds of clauses in, 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 their, in their teachings. And there's a reason for all that. And it's, it's partly about morality, but it's also about sustainability. It's about mutual aid, it's about communities, it's about rural households and how those rural households did not operate through an interest-bearing economy and a debt-based system. They actually operated out of community engagement and relationships. And those are the kinds of things we're trying to recapture here, not to go back to the romantic past, but to say, what would that look like now on a global scale? A global scale meaning it's comprised of all the different localities that are expressing that without having a kind of, uh, you know, broader uh, vision where it's um, expressed necessarily in an international dimension. I mean, through uh, IMF or World Bank or United Nations type of format. 
interest rates are critical leverage point for us now because uh, they express something that's purposive. And that's where I like the Hegelian sort of dialectic in the, in the sense that, it, for me, it gives me some explanatory power around something that I notice. Now, the, uh, in that diagram, when you saw rivalrous and excludable and non-rivalrous and non-excludable, the reason that keeps us in a box is that those are arbitrary categories. Those are categories that the capitalist system chose, and it filtered it through itself through the, uh, the academic uh, literature, through the Eleanor, Vincent Ostrom and Eleanor Ostrom. And it's something that we take very seriously. Now, people coming into the comments movement say, oh, yeah, rival wars. What does that mean? Oh, excludable. Well, how can I get my head around that? The fact that it's not intuitive should tell you something. What is intuitive is that what we're looking at out there, and what we understand is the dialectic of this time is a private system and a public system that is entrenched. They're working together, but they also have their own particular interests. That is part of the two prongs of the dialectic that is in our face. Why should we be looking at rivalrous and, and excludable as kind of major categories, when the categories that we really have to react to are right there in front of us, which is that the private sector is saying what it's saying, and the public sector is saying what it's saying. And where are we in this? Oh my gosh. We're in a place in this third sector where we're actually transcending civil society now because the civil society is embedded in the private sector to a great extent and embedded in the, in the market state duopoly. So what, breaking loose and actually commenting at this point is a tremendous transformational thing for us to see us as a third sector, but also to recognize that private and public came out of the larger commons in the first place. So if we're going to transform government and markets into the greater biosphere. We've got to make that larger realization. Now, what interest rates do is they give us a, a background in terms of the value of our currency that we all take for granted. Nobody criticizes interest rates. The, 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 the discussion we had last night here, which was a brilliant discussion about student debt and, and the perniciousness of student debt and how people are now becoming debt slaves at a very young age because of the loans that they're taking out uh, and that uh, how long is it going to take to, to pay off these loans? My God, what's, you know, what can we do? Well, the fact is that it's not just student debt, but it's every aspect of the economy is debt laden. And in a fractional banking system, this is what we have. And why? Because we've got interest rates. And as the ecological economists have said right from the beginning, including particularly Nicholas Georgescu Rajan, who is such a brilliant economist, the fact is that, that the, um, the interest rate develops at a, at a rate that is much faster, much higher gradient than the uh, speed at which resources replenish themselves. So that's where our dichotomy comes in. And that's why their excuses like rivalrous and, and excludable have to be manufactured to justify that. Those are completely arbitrary categories. But we take it looking at Wikipedia as received wisdom. Oh, this is what the commons is, because some scholars, James Buchanan and others, have said that this is the framework. So we take it seriously, and we have to put ourselves in that box. That's not my intuitive reality. When I look out there, I see, I see public and private. But I also see the very essence of the economy as something that makes sense to me that some resources are replenishable. Intellectual resources, uh, some aspects of nature are replenishable. Many other kinds of things, creativity and the arts, and we know the replenishable resources. Some are not replenishable. They're depletable. And we know what those are. But they're right there. We have the basis between a, an abundance and sufficiency kind of economy <coughs> where we know that there's replenishable resources, and we have also the commitment to scarcity economy, which is where we are stuck. And now, the thing is, if you're looking at <coughs> solutions for the future, and we're talking about complementary currencies, and we're talking about, and I'm not going to talk about time banks, but I, I would like to talk just a bit about other kinds of complementary currencies that people have been proposing. If we're looking at demurrage or negative interest rates, we're making a big mistake. Sylvia Jessel and Keynes and others have talked about negative interest rates. We've got these interest rates that are uh, linear projections into the future, which are driving the economy. And they're leading to overconsumption and overproduction, creating an ecological crisis. 
So people say, all we need to do is get negative interest rates, because if we had that, and a negative interest rate is a penalty on you for hoarding your money for too long. So if you keep your money in the bank or in your pocket and you don't spend it, then uh, you'll be penalized and you have to pay a fee. And ideally, the idea is that, is that you will put more money into circulation and you will counterbalance the pernicious effects of interest rates. I don't think so, because that doesn't change the whole system. Have you really got to the root of why interest rates are there in the first place? What you're doing is just modifying the system. You're trying to neutralize it. You're not changing the system. It's a, it's a weak um, counter argument to try to, to do something in the face of something that is such a steamroller and such a, a huge uh, problem that we can't get our minds around it because we take it so for granted. The value of our currency is something that we don't understand. We don't understand where interest rates come from. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. And, uh, it's, uh, it's a weird uh, All right, so, this is so offer where for are we going with this? With, because if we are conceiving of interest rates as being the, the measure of progress in civilization, and that's what the market state is actually telling us, that it's, it all comes down to interest rates. And of course, I, you know, there are other points of, of departure here. But this is a, an unconscious, it seems to me, an unarticulated, Thing that has to be to be um, to to be addressed, and so we've got public and private. That's a, a very intuitive reality. We've got depletable resources and sustainable resources, and and, uh, and replenishable resources, and that's also something that is a structural principle coming to us from the ecology, from the biosphere. We recognize that that's a reality. The economy has to be modeled on that. Instead of interest rates, we should be thinking about sustainability, not through adjusting our prices, but adjusting the value of our currency according to the sustainability of the planet. There's nothing more important than that. And yet our conversations don't seem to gravitate there because we've been captured by a, a neoliberal discourse which tells us the fact that, that there is a scarcity model even that, go, that goes on all the time and interest rates is part of it. And who are you to challenge the interest rate uh, if you are going to raise the price of gas, for example, if you're going to, to, to adjust uh, the, the, the problem of uh, uh, depletable resources in the world, or if you're going to do it completely through the, uh, through the price system. In other words, what's happened under neoliberalism is we've divided off between the unity that used to have meaning for people, that fact and value were coupled. In other words, the mind and the, and the heart were coupled. And now they're divided. We've divided them because of the crippling effects that we've had um, through the um, interpretation of the differences between prices and the value of our currency. We're more concerned with prices than we are with the value of the currency. And the value of the currency has everything to do with the interest rates. Who is setting the interest rates? Handful of Federal Reserve people and a few central bankers across the world are setting the interest rates. They're setting the collective value of the planet for all of us, and we all have to respond to it. So collective value has other meanings. It has personal meanings. It has, um, it has uh, intersubjectivity. It has, it, it, all the things that we've been talking about in the first uh, discussion today is, is, is all about that collective value. And yet we, we, we give ourselves over to the system that continues to say that it all you know, boils down in an objective sense to what these interest rates give us, and that's all we can take from it. In a broader perspective, the interest rate is a measure of um, a historical progression that is argued that uh, you can't tamper with that, and yet it's a very arbitrary construct, and it's fed to us, spoon-fed to us by the banks. We don't critique it much. We, we complain about the debt-based economy, but what are we doing about it? We're not, doing, we're not getting at the heart of the structural problem that it represents. Um, it seems to me that what we have to do is take our eyes off of prices and look more at the sustainability behind currency value, not only at the local levels with complementary currencies, but also at the international level, and how we uh, create a system that really expresses, uh, expresses that. That's the only thing that's going to bring fact and morality back together. Because the two things have been separated. Fact 
and moral value completely separated now, where we don't really care much about the moral value anymore. It's all about the fact, fact meaning crisis, not the, the value of the collective value that we express, um, which has been given to us through the idea of, um, of currency value, which we have to take as received wisdom, because that's uh, some arbitrary measure that we have to conform to. Uh, lastly, I just want to mention that uh, there was a brilliant essay written in the 1950s by Norman O. Brown, and he talks about interest rates as being a sublimation of people's aspirations for uh, Godhead, or for spiritual realization, or for immortality. And he says that what, what it really means is that the interest rate behind your money will live on after you. Your money will live on after you. Which is why in a, in a kind of godless society, we project onto money something that it doesn't exist in money, which is that it has this purposive power behind it. It will grow after you're dead and gone. It's a very interesting idea, but it affects us all deeply, subjectively. Because even though we say, well, I don't really believe in that, when we leave here, we're still investing money, we're still, you know, we're, we're still playing around with interest rates all the time. At five o'clock, at six o'clock, when we listen to the news, it's the, you know, the market go up or the market go down. And everybody worships at the altar of the market because we want to know what the interest rate just did. It's the number one value that we have that is corrupting everybody. And the problem is we, we, we don't like it, it's creating cultural and political schizophrenia everywhere in the world. That's why the protests are taking place. I mean, there are many other issues. Obviously, there's national sovereignty, private property issues, and capital accumulation, and wealth consolidation, and state legal monopoly over state um, enforcement of um, busting the commons. The commons, after all, is an unconstitutional kind of thing. Because, because all state constitutions are really doing is protecting the rights of private property. And the rights of private property are outside of the prospect of the commons. So when we're, when we're talking about uh, state issues, we're really talking about the prerogatives of the private sector. That's why the market state duality has to be challenged. Can't be challenged unless we get beyond the Constitution, and unless we really begin to get at the heart of interest rates, understand it, and move more towards sustainability rather than interest rates. And don't move towards sustainability through the price system, through the libertarian kind of interpretations, or, uh, but the commons has to have its own understanding of, of the, uh, the, the meaning of interest rates and the purposiveness of history to get us where we need to go. The evolutionary dimensions of the progress of the planet, progress meaning something different than what people mean by it in, in capitalism. Thank you.